my best guess is we're going through a major revolution in human awareness and learning and thinking. And in this revolution, we will have the time before we thought, before we recognize that that time doesn't work the way we thought it was, and then after we realized that we were wrong about that. That time is at least, at least all at once, if not multiple instances of events across the universe. We will have the time before we recognize that non-physical reality has influences on physical reality and may actually create physical reality, and then we will have the time after that. I think we're going through kind of a new enlightenment. Welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Julia Mossbridge. Julia, welcome. Hey, thanks. Okay, so you're a cognitive scientist and you focus on precognition. Could you just tell me a little bit about yourself? Just quick background and then we can get started. Yeah, I'm actually a cognitive neuroscientist, so there's a difference which doesn't matter. And <laughs> yeah, I screwed it up. I, I, yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Whatever. It's my training. Mostly what I do now is talk to people about the science that I have done and do a little bit of science on extraordinary cases on the side. But I focus on precognition and technology development and also creating technology development for our future that's related to AI and to our capacity to navigate the future. So that's now, what I do. Now, you recently moved from Northern California to Washington, D.C. Yeah, wow. I know. The way you say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I'm from California. Like, California's got its problems, but it's really nice out here. <laughs> You're projecting your bias all over the place. Northern California, the good place to Washington, D.C. Yeah, I know. I love Northern California. I grew up in the Chicago area, and moving to California was just like a dream it's amazing. And I haven't given up on Northern California. I have a house there. We're renting out the house. Okay. But we're renting a place in DC, my husband and I, or not DC really, actually Fairfax, Virginia. But the last three years, I've felt this sort of, I almost want to call it a calling. Probably that's most accurate, a feeling of, I have to go to DC area. I need to try to do something in the federal government or to support the federal government in helping navigate the future. Because I think about time differently than the most people probably because of my work on precognition, but also my, my lifelong experience as a precognitive person. And I don't know if it's going to work out. I might end up working in AI and see what I can do with AI and navigating the future. There's a lot to do there. So we'll see. But that's what's going on right now. And in fact, the reason why you see me talking on a microphone and a stack of books is I'm staying at a friend's house and house sitting while she's in Texas. And my husband and I are just living here until we are ready to move into our house. So it's all just very hacky, which is sort of how my life is, I think. Like I follow the next thing that feels good or feel that I get curious about and go towards it. And I don't do a lot of questioning. And the universe, or whatever you want to call it, seems to oblige by shutting off all sources of income in whatever thing I'm leaving and turning on sources of income in the thing that I'm going towards. So it's a nice signal. Yeah, I've actually experienced some of that. I won't get into it, but it's kind of like suddenly just things appear and you're like, oh, yeah, this makes sense. I should be doing this for this reason, et cetera. And it's almost looks like the universe kind of sends you signs that you're in the right place at the right time. And, and you at least the last 20 years of my life, they send you signals that you're not supposed to be doing this. <laughs> Turns out there's another <laughs> like, thing. <laughs> like you're suffering for a reason. So, uh, but I couldn't have been there here without doing all that. Okay. So you said you've been a pre cog all your life. Say a little bit more about that. How did you recognize or realize that? Sure. I usually tell the story of my first precognitive dream that I remember, which was when I was seven. I actually think before that I was having precognitive dreams, I just didn't remember them. I was scientific enough, my nature is scientific enough to sort of question myself when I have a, even as a kid, like, what is this? Why do I think that I experienced this before? Do I remember my dreams correctly? 
So I started keeping a dream journal and I've kept one for the most part ever since. And that has really helped me ask, answer my question, am I remembering this correctly? And sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. <laughs> and it's good to notice the difference when I'm sort of trying to force something to be precognitive versus, oh no, I really like, here is what happened. But the dream was really mundane, which is very common for precognitive dreams. It was that mm -hmm. a particular friend would lose her watch on the playground the next day. And that, and that happened the next day at, at recess. So those were the the components. And that is what happened. And it's so mundane, but also very specific and also mm -hmm. boring. Like it's a boring dream. <laughs> it wasn't like, and then there was the invasion of whatever. It's like she lost her watch. But why did I dream that? And I think it when I look at why, because people ask me that a lot on about precognition, because I I research it now and, and have for about 15 or 20 years. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. I had Ingo Swan explain this to me in a dream once. <laughs> I was having a precognitive dream more later in my I was in my 40s. And Ingo Swan, and I didn't know what he looked like at the time, so I didn't know it was Ingo Swan until later. In fact, I talked about this dream on Unexplained, and at that time I didn't know it was Ingo Swan either. But he showed up and he was like a guide. And after he showed me the event that I was precognizing, which was a, a bombing in Kuwait City, Kuwait, during noontime prayers, after he showed me that, and it, that was very matter of fact, although I was like, oh, this was horrible. I didn't feel good about it, but it was that what he was showing me was matter of fact about this event. He took me aside and he said, this is how it works. And he was carrying on his back a quiver with a bunch of arrows in it. And he said, you know, you reach back, you don't know which arrow you're getting, and you go. And the arrows are not chosen by you, they're what's in your quiver. So the arrows are the topic. So my understanding is the arrows are the topic of the dream. Like I have no relationship with Kuwait City, Kuwait. I'm Jewish, I'm not Muslim. I didn't know anyone there. I don't know why that particular arrow was in my quiver, but you reach back and you get what's there. And that was profoundly helpful to me to stop asking that question of why. It's like taking it more as at least when you're having these spontaneous precognitions rather than doing something like precognitive remote viewing where you're intentionally going after whatever the tasking is, in these spontaneous precognitions, stopping asking this question why and instead just saying, this is what I got, it was my arrow, and I'm just going to report it to my journal. In fact, the other day I had the weirdest one where I got a phone number. I've never gotten a phone number in my dream. This guy in the dream was following me, FBI agent. And I just jumped on the hood of the car and I said, what? Like, why are you following me? He said, call the office. I don't work for the FBI. And I said, what office? He said, call the office. I said, what's the phone number? <laughs> and he gave it to me and I woke up and I wrote it down. And in the morning I Googled it and it was a phone number related to some stuff that I'm not going to say out loud, but it was important information. And so sometimes it's like that. And I don't was know it real phone number that when you oh called yeah real it, phone number it was, that it was I really related to this topic in, in some the DC way. area related to this topic so I did I dealt with that but so I again I don't know why that was my arrow and so I guess I take it as a little piece of the universe saying like you're part of the universe just like everyone else is part of the universe and you don't get to understand necessarily why this is the action that needs to be done but this is the action that needs to be done. What's the deal with numbers? 
my understanding is it's <laughs> not. I no, the reason question. I ask this is because I've had a dream like that. And I'll just say what the number was. It was like four or five, which I was assuming is April 5th. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what that means or why it's important. But my understanding, or again, not understanding, but kind of the lore is not the right word either. But you hear people say, <laughs> people are saying that are saying. numbers don't come as easy in these sorts of things like people don't often see numbers people don't often particularly with remote viewing like there's a whole area of remote viewing i think it's like stage seven or something like that that you have to learn in order to read or see numbers so is there something to that or is that just kind of an old wife's tale sort of thing it's both so numbers come quite a lot in spontaneous precognition like a dream or just like a waking vision or something Numbers come quite a lot. And numbers can come quite a lot in remote viewing, and they're usually analytic overlay. Yep. Uh, same with like letters. Usually, unless you've trained to separate it out or you happen to be magically scaled like Pat Price, it's analytic overlay. I think our better bet at getting numbers is through spontaneous means like dreams. I mean, I think using. If you look at remote viewing and the way it's been developed in the military and intelligence circles, and then after that, and if you look at dream precognition, they both have shared elements that are true for them and that they can tap into future events, et cetera. Like they can be metaphorical or they could be factual or both, but also they have these distinct elements. And if you're going to get a number correct, I think it's going to come from a dream unless you've been trained up to really, really tame all that analytic overlay and get it in remote viewing. I to advertise on Through Glass Darkly, email throughglassdarkly ads at gmail.com. And then sort of answering the question more deeply, the unconscious wants to speak in symbols and metaphors. And numbers are symbols. Letters are symbols too, but they have to be put into context to mean something. Mm -hmm. uh, except for things like Hebrew letters are also numbers. So that's it, it'd be interesting to do a study on people who speak Hebrew and whether they can get letters better. You should have Uri Geller on this thing okay. and ask him about that. But it, in English, the letter has a purpose, which is to become a word, and it's not a symbol. And so, numbers, I think, can be more symbolic for us and help us bubble up the information from our unconscious minds a little better. So, I think it's mixed. I think it's complex and kind of mixed. Okay. All right. So, one of the things you mentioned that you do is you keep a dream journal. And by the way, this is not the first time I've heard that. Are you familiar with Eric Wargo? Time oh, loops. yeah, good friend, also in the D.C. area. <laughs> and, um, Interesting. Yeah, and yeah. neat. I just love his Time Loops book. His Time Loops book came out on the same day as my Premonition Code book. Same day, October 18th, 2018. That's cool. Interesting. Well, again, that's probably not a coincidence. Who knows? Right? <laughs> it's, it's probably it, not. At this point, like the fantasy that we could figure out how it works is hilarious okay so you're in dc you're trying to get the government to do or at least look at the future a little bit more holistically yeah i know that there used to be this office called the office of net assessment i mean there still is but <laughs> they used to focus on kind of intermediate to far future stuff like 25 years out and it was headed by this guy, Andy Marshall. That was his first uh, yeah, name. Yeah, Andrew couldn't Marshall. couldn't remember all that. And I think he left, and he was right during the Bush administration. He was, or later, I, I think he was in his 90s when he left. And he had been there for a very long time. But it was this unit within the Pentagon or organization within the Pentagon that would do these kind of far-ranging assessments of the future. What do they do now, and what do you think the government – should be doing or how should it be looking at these future assessments 
I don't know what they're doing now. I just know that they're not doing the same thing that they used to do. I don't have enough inside information. I'm not in the federal government. I'm just talking to people. So what I hear when I talk to people is that it's not doing what it used to do because it's not funded, right, like it used to be. So I think what they used to do was actually also, in addition to do this kind of strategic foresight, they also gave grants to wild research ideas related to trying to navigate the future uh, and future technologies. So it does seem like something that would be useful right about now with AI and such. <laughs> so maybe that funding went to Biden's executive order recently it speaks to how we have to basically hire a bunch of people in the federal government who understand AI and, and how to navigate that. So that could be where that went. I don't know. But this idea of foresight, there are various people who have been involved at, at high levels in the federal government who have said, yeah, strategic foresight is really important. Like, of course, the immediate threat is always overtaking our emotional state, right? Mm -hmm. We have to deal with Israel Hamas. We have to deal with Ukraine. Those things are true. And it's not that it's not true. It's just that it's not a zero-sum game. You also need to be dealing with things that can be emerging 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 50 years out. And that helps you deal with the thing now because you have the event in context and it helps train your analysts who are helping you try to predict what the best course of action would be to live in a longer time frame mm -hmm. to see many more cause effects relationships and to understand where the world could be going so that we can then get it there or avoid it depending on where that could be going is and so it seems to me that that effort something that matters to me, it's something that matters to many people who work in intelligence or, or who work in the military, work in national security. And it's a hard sell because it's like, no, but we have Israel Hamas and we have Ukraine. Right. And that's and that assumes and that's under the assumption that time is unidirectional. What's always the sell is that time is unidirectional, and if we act now, we can change these different things and stuff. That's the sell, because that's how people think about it. But it's not I, unidirectional, is it? Time? I don't I think it's directional. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, so how, how would you characterize time? Like, is it simultaneous? Does it move in? I mean, it sounds like no direction, but somebody might say it works in both directions, like with the concept of ritual causality, things like that. I mean, so if you, is, I'm a, it's yeah. complicated. It's, I'm a huge champion of retro causality or the idea of looking into it because, of course, I'm fascinated by the idea of informational time travel. And in fact, last year at University of San Diego, which is where I have an affiliation in the physics and biophysics department, the reason I have affiliation there is because I was working with Daniel Sheehan, who's in that department to put together a quantum time machines meeting. So we got, it was a closed meeting, invite only from about 30 to 35 physicists and philosophers and neuroscientists from around the world interested in this idea of sending a message back in time and how might we would do that. So it was like a working meeting. So it, it was on the heels of what Daniel had set up, which is this quantum retro causality series with the Association for the Advancement of Science. So retrocausality always bothered me as a concept because it suggests now, okay, time's going in the other direction. <laughs> like, oh, that doesn't seem any more enlightened than time going in the, this first direction. But it is there to explain some phenomena that are easier to explain, like quantum entanglement, for instance, if you use retrocausality. So what I think is going on when people ask me the question, how does time work? What people haven't sorted out and what I try to help them sort out and what I also haven't sorted out, so it makes helping them sort it out harder, is that what we are talking about when we talk about time is we have my experience of time, we have another person's experience of time, so that's one thing that's different, right? There's sort of human experience of time, there's cultural experience of time. And then there's something that we're going to decide, assuming the physical world exists, we're going to decide is called the physical time. And notice how experience is not in there because we can't really know, we can't really experience that. That's, how, that's conjecture, right? Based on data, we try to figure out how time works in the physical world. Mm -hmm. It's clear that it works differently from how it works in our experience. But that actually can be news to some physicists. So some physicists 
haven't yet realized that many of the things that they're trying to explain are things that are actually perceptions that aren't represented the same way in the physical world. So we're kind of going through a revolution in physics where some physicists are saying, wait a minute, am I explaining what I perceive or the physical world? Because they're not the same. And it's kind of like we could have avoided this if like a hundred years ago we made physicists take classes in perceptual psychology, but you know, showing them like one visual optical illusion and say, sorry, you can't get out of this. You're going to perceive this as moving even though it's static. And so and well, in so, the 1950s and 60s, they used the exact well, not yeah, they used the exact same technique to debunk experiencers, right? Well, exactly. And then actually the reason why the Stargate program was started by physicists of all people, even though it was clearly a psychological set of experiments. And frankly, I think it would have been better if you had used psychologists because you're working with people's minds. But in any case, the reason why it was started by physicists is because there's this sort of social hierarchy that says that physicists are at the top of the sciences. And so, if physicists can, so, so the CIA says, look, let's get some physicists. If they think that this is real, then it's real. So, the idea of what is real, when people ask me, how does time work? They're kind of asking, what is real? And we get to this question that we haven't sorted out. You know, is experience, do we count that experience as real? Do we count only shared experience as real? Do we count my experience as real, as real if it's different from your experience? And then we also, do we count the physical world as real? If we count the physical world as real, how do we figure out the relationship between our experience and the physical world? So to answer the question, sorry to critique the question, I had to do it. But to answer the question, <laughs> right. originally, how I think time works for human beings is we do have generally, when we're consciously aware, in a standard sort of everyday conscious state, not in an altered conscious state, and not in deep sleep. And not when we're dead, but when we're in this particular state, we have a unidirectional sense of the flow of time. Sense um, being the key word, sense. Yeah, no, no, it's a fabrication. I mean, it's a representation. We're watching our conscious minds are presenting to us. This, this is a movie of what just happened. This is a movie of what just happened. It's never not that. What about the physical reality? Right. So, in physical reality, and I also think in the unconscious. Which, uh, which is 95% or more of the rest of what our brain is doing. Time doesn't work like that. So, we are presented with this reality that I think is the exception rather than the rule. I think in physical reality, I'm leaning, there's really no way to separate right now as far as I can tell these theories. Maybe I'm narrowing in on way to separate it, but I'm leaning towards the all at once picture. So, like mm -hmm. time is more like a landscape painting. And our perception moves across it. Like we are aware, now we're aware of having this conversation. In an hour, we're going to be aware of, I'm going to have lunch. In an hour after that, we're going to be aware of another meeting. So it's the story of what we're aware of is the story of the relationship between our experience and what the physical, what's happening in the physical world. So having said that, if you believe in that, what that opens up is the possibility that your aware, your unconscious mind, if your unconscious mind has more access to this whole landscape, that your unconscious mind can leak information into your conscious mind and say, like, "Hey, there's a 9/11 down the street. <laughs> I noticed, and maybe you could prepare for that in some kind of way, like not going into work that day." It sounds to me, and again, correct me if I get this analogy wrong, but it's almost like a series of radio stations across different frequencies. And when there's an event like 9-11 up here at this frequency and you're back here at a lower frequency, which is, let's just say is earlier time, right? Again, just a radio, they're all happening simultaneously. When there's a event like 9-11, there's maybe a perturbance in the force. So you have your, you know, like a frequency on a radio wave. It's not like this, just one straight line. It's, there's like a wave pattern where you you know where there's some overlap there's some leak through that you're talking about maybe mm -hmm. when you have an event like 911 that fringe kind of bleeds off cuz it's a big spike big noise like an energetic spike energy spike that might bleed back and forward into time it's, when you talk like that i start thinking about signal detection theory right because i'm thinking yeah. about these right 
And well, I'm an electrical of, engineer by training, so I'm uh, yeah, yeah, okay, right. Yeah. So I, d- I studied psychoacoustics, so all about auditory yeah. signals. So one implication of let's be really nerdy, and one implication of like increasing the peak is if it's a normal distribution, sometimes you can have like. It depends, right? What is the standard deviation? Are you having a narrowing? Is it the same amount of energy, but in this narrow space, in which case you have less access to it, or in a broader space? So one of the ways I yeah like fat tails, fat tails, fat tails. You have fatter tails, right? Right. And so one of the ways I like to think about it that gives non-signal detection theory nerds a better metaphor, I think, is that people are more familiar with. But I, I like that metaphor. I just think it's less accessible. Is you ever stick your finger in the water as it's coming out of the tap yeah, rip. and you notice there's a wake of course towards the mm-hmm. towards the basin we know about wakes that's reasonable but there's also this little back pressure here that puts a little bubble above your finger so imagine that your mind is going along and it goes wait i sense that something's different here there must be something coming up that's obstructing the water right and that is sensing that from the bubble so I'm imagining that's happening in time, and that if this is a big finger or like your whole hand, there's going to be a bigger bubble. So if it's mm-hmm. a big event like 9/11, more back pressure in the water. That's the way. That's the way. Does that mean any anything? Yeah. Now I'm going to throw something crazy at you. Okay. So yeah. You were modeling things as a normal distribution. What if it's a power law distribution? Right. So it might be power law. In which case, it's all yeah. scalable. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think it is a power law. <laughs> so like, and that's why when you get into these metaphors and you really explore them, you're like, ah, but it's not that. I do think it's more like a power law. And I do think it's scalable. And I think that at every temporal scale, we're used to thinking about spatial scales, right? By the way, but for it, the audience, a power <laughs> law is a distribution such that it's like Pareto. A Pareto distribution is an example of a power law, which is oh, that'll twenty percent of people owned eighty percent of land in Italy. Pareto. That's so you have you know a small number of people where things can have a disproportionate outcome. That's what we're talking about. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just had to. Well, no, but it's another another feature. It's interesting you're going in that direction. So another feature of a power law is it's scalable. Like if you zoom in on it, it's still a power law. Mm. Right, it doesn't look so different. Yeah. Whereas, right, and so a lot of things in nature are power laws, and they scale. And so, if I zoom in to the time frame, I should have information at the physiological level that operates on the millisecond basis. And you do. You you have this thing called presentiment, which is how I first got into the field, which is studying physiological changes on the millisecond to second scale before an event occurs. You could see it in the brain on the millisecond scale. Or hundreds of millisecond scale, you can see it in the body or body res- physical behavioral responses on the more second scale. But then you could also see the same thing happening at the hormonal level, I believe. It hasn't been tested, but I believe based on some preliminary evidence and self-testing that you could see this on the hormonal level. And I think you could see it on the behavioral level, which is even it's somewhere in between these. And you could see it on the conscious level, which is it could be days, weeks, months, years. And that's why it's not a perfect metaphor to have a static sort of signal that you're using. It's more like this power law signal. I like that. And, for, yeah, and in terms of how to at least scale that if you're predicting futures, there's a technique called Monte Carlo simulation where you just feed a power law wave into a function or system and then the output that you get is your range of outcomes depending on whatever changes you made in that system and you can just be anyway, arbitrary with the units and it's still gonna hold yeah okay now precognition and remote viewing i think on the tim venturis show you said something about you would give remote viewers a target but you wouldn't know the target but they would do their work and you would keep a stack yeah. of their output. And then when you had a question, you would say, okay, here's my question. And it t- talk me through that process. That's amazing. And it, I know. And I have and to repeat it, this. And, and, and it works too, apparently. Yeah. I think it works better than the forward direction. Okay. 
here's the process. So I've got a team of people I've vetted who are skilled at this. So they already know how to work this way. So maybe another team who didn't know how to work this way would have a problem, but they know how to work this way. So I have a spreadsheet and I put in the spreadsheet like a tag, which is a set of numbers that arbitrary. I don't know what the tag is associated with when I put it in the spreadsheet. I just write down 32146918. Okay. And when they want to, when they're ready, they look in the spreadsheet and they're like, oh, there's a new tag. I'll go do that. And they do the session with the intention of getting the best answer to the question that will eventually be associated with that number. So that's their intention. So not only do they need to sort of precognize the question, which by the way, they may never see, they need to precognize the answer. So they need to get information about a question that they may or may not see. And then they need to get the answer to that question, which maybe no one on the planet knows if it's correct, right? Because there's some client who obviously is turning to remote viewing to answer a question, which means they're desperate usually, right? So so it's a lot of intentional work. And what happens is at some point I run across a client or I have a question myself about world events that I think would be useful to know the answer to. Like I did this recently with the shutdown in October. I was talking to a group of national security people and I'm like, hey, I have this team. Do you want me just to ask if there's going to be a shutdown? Because y'all are sweating it. And I don't think there's going to be a shutdown. <laughs> Do you want me to ask? And they're like, sure. So they they each actually hold on to their results. But then when I send out an email that says, hey, now we have a tasking for this number that I just said to you, but I, of course, can't remember. But for this thing, they send me their session. So their session is done. It's dated, whatever, two months ago, right? Now I know what that number is associated with. I know what the question is. Depending on the situation, I may never tell them what that is. But they know now that there's a tasking associated with it. Then as an analyst, I go through, I know each of their minds, I know kind of how their unconscious minds work a little bit. And I go through and I analyze their data in light of the question that's just been associated. Then I go to the client, in which in this case, it was just a group of people in national security. And I said, okay, my team says it's very clear. There's total agreement. There's not going to be a shutdown. There's going to be bigger problems after that, but no shutdown. In fact, that session was so clear that I actually retasked it on something else because it was boring. I mean, it was so, it was not very interesting to answer that question because they answered it within the first page. <laughs> so it's like, all right. That's how it works. And so just to break it down to simpler steps, one, answer the question, but that you don't know what it is. No one knows what it is. Two, the tasker finds out what the question is, gathers the data, Three, the analyst, which could be different from the tasker, but in this case, it's the same. It's me. Analyze the data to get the answer. And four, communicate the answer to the client. So that's really what it is. I think it's incredibly unbiasing on the part of the data, right? Because they don't know what the question is, so they're unbiased. It's biased on the part of the analyst. I know what the question is. So I have to look at my own bias. And actually, so to help remove some of that analytic bias, I am one of the viewers. So I do my own session when I don't know what it's assigned to. And I put it aside in a stack. And I don't look at it. And I have a bunch of those. And I have no idea what's in there. And then when the question comes to me from either a client or something I'm curious about, then I go back and I use my session as a guardian against because I'm pretty good at it, I use my session as a guardian against analytic bias. Does anybody else use this method? Yeah, I think Courtney knowledge? Brown actually wrote a paper on this okay. method. And then John Vivanco is the one who taught me the method. I worked with him. He was a colleague of Prudence Calabrese, who no longer does remote viewing. But they started transdimensional systems back in the 90s, right when it got declassified. Okay. Now, there's a lot that seems to be going on in the background right now. In well, I mean, even in the foreground with Israel and Hamas, you have Russia, Ukraine, and there's just that we have an election next year. There's a lot of instability with the prospect of even more instability. 
And then you have kind of this UAP or demands for UAP disclosure in the background. Based on your work, what is really going on? <laughs> is there some sort of like, <laughs> I- I'm just trying to be clear with the question. Okay. There seems to be something in the zeitgeist that is beyond the physical. Yeah. I don't know what that is, but there there seems to be something yeah. to it. Yeah. What, in your opinion, and I don't think anybody really knows, but what's your kind of best hypothesis for what the heck's going on right now? Okay, that's a fun question. <laughs> it's a fun question, but it's not an easy question. <laughs> no, I mean, I certainly can't answer it. My answer right. will certainly be incorrect. Let me just say that. But it's my sense. I'm giving it. I mean, every answer yes. I've given is my sense. And there may be things that I'm just incorrect about it. That's fine. Whatever. We all just have a piece of the puzzle. You know what I'm saying? My best guess is we're going through a major revolution in human awareness and learning and thinking. And in this revolution, we will have the time before we thought, before we recognize that that time doesn't work the way we thought it was. And then after we realized that we were wrong about that, that time is at least, at least all at once, if not multiple instances of events across the universe. We will have the time before we recognize that non-physical reality has influences on physical reality and may actually create physical reality. And then we will have the time after that. I think we're going through kind of a new enlightenment Mm -hmm. where we'll have the time before when we thought that science was this independent thing that couldn't be touched by spirituality or human need for mystical connection and the time after that. So this is a really powerful time of change. So I think that's what's going on in terms of UFOs, it seems like they've always been around, mm-hmm. but there's clearly discussions of these things in records from thousands of years ago, right? So I think we're going also from a time when we say, we have just gone through a time when we, for a couple hundred years, have disavowed the human experience of mysticism and unconscious promptings and the relationship between the non-physical and the physical, and we're coming into the I think we're going to be moving into an incredible avowal of that as we see it. So what do I think? So I think that the UFOs are showing us, honestly, this is such a combination of answers between kind of like a Jeffrey Kripal answer or Kripal, it's Kripal, I think. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. And also maybe a Diana Pasolka answer, but I think that UFOs are essentially a physical manifestation of the collective unconscious. Interesting. And when I say physical manifestation, many people who study UFOs, so I'm involved in the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, I'm involved sort of behind the scenes with Soul Foundation, and then sort of behind the scenes with Galileo Project. People who study UFOs will sometimes say, don't say that it has anything to do with consciousness or the mind, because people will say that it's not real. And I say this from the point of view of someone who feels that for a long time we've had evidence that human thought and non-human thought, things that we consider non-physical, can have an impact, a big impact on the physical world. So I'm not saying it's not real. I'm saying that what's real is that our minds have consequences and our thoughts have consequences. Thoughts create things basically they help yeah i think i think well, i mean go, look you you can be you can be expansive about that or you can be literal about that right it's yeah thoughts prob- have effects it's probably on, not a literal thing but it's like thoughts have effects on things yeah yeah like if i want to create a podcast right yeah. it doesn't just manifest i have to actually do it but i have you know those thoughts were manifested into action i'm, right, I'm, you know, I'm not taking does- the extreme woo right exactly yeah, but it could be the i mean yeah. so the problem is the extreme woo could be correct like it could be i wrote this whole book with iman spur is called transcendent mind about how potentially the mental could create the physical i mean like that could be what's real in fact we call it woo because we don't consider it real because we're in this culture right now that considers only physical things real so i don't want to take that away i just want to yeah. say like that extreme case you don't have to suppose that to say just 
one thought could have one actual effect on a physical system, and that changes everything. What do you think is going to happen with disclosure? People, I just want so much compassion in the disclosure space. I've talked to, I felt compelled last, I think it was last fall, to do a, yeah, it was, to do a series of interviews with people in the in the nonprofit and academic UFO research space. And I kind of wrote up my results on Medium. And I just want so much compassion for that space because there's a whole group of people who think that it's the right thing to do to protect people from information that they think is going to freak them out too much. And they really think it's the right thing to do, and they think they're doing the compassionate thing. And then there's a group of people who think it's the right thing to do to disclose that all information all over the place, and they think that's the right thing to do. And it's like, if we could get it that what people in that space are earnestly trying to do is what they think the right thing to do is, you can have mm -hmm. compassion for the person who holds the opposite view. And to understand that there really are intelligence needs around not reporting on underwater sensors and stuff like this. Like, you know, that's where the Russian submarines are with nuclear weapons. And so it's like, it's not a lie that there's a need for secrecy in yeah. some situations. And so just like, I keep wanting, I talked to, do you know Hussein uh, Grama at the University of Chicago? He does no, some I don't work with. Say more. He's a neat anthropologist at University of Chicago who does some really interesting work. Uh, I think he's done work with Jeff Kripal and maybe okay. with Diana Pasolka on this, but you know, I, I've talked with him about the idea of having a conference of people involved in edge science. So not just UFO stuff, but I, I mean, I shouldn't say just, it's a big field. Not only UFO folks, but people who study psychic stuff, people who study cold fusion. I actually think that's part of the problem today yeah. is people are categorizing things in discrete buckets. But if yeah. you sp like I spent two years on this topic and yeah. within the first six months, it became very clear that it's not just nuts and bolts, right? Yeah. There's a nuts and bolts aspect, yeah. but there's also this non-physical aspect and our culture has just kind of dampened it. And even as you were saying, some people just want to like, don't talk about the, you know, the, the woo stuff because it's, and I think, Number one, I think the current approach is a disaster. I think it has the potential to lead to even greater instability because as each day passes, credibility in the institutions is deteriorating. And we could be at a point where we literally disclose and people are like, I don't believe you. Oh, absolutely. And I think, I think we're getting to that point sooner rather than later. And I think the government, and again, I have a dark mind. I also write horror and stuff like that. So <laughs> me too. I write thrillers and for the same reason, you get it out of your mind. It, yeah. But I, I think this is the last chance. I think this is the government's last chance before we go into a period of significant instability. And I see, I think they're going to pull it off though. I mean, I just, I think I was at Arlington cemetery yesterday for the first time and my husband grew up in the area. He's been there a lot, but he was taking me there and showing me all the things, you know, and uh, came across John F. Kennedy's grave and then Robert F. Kennedy's grave. And something about Robert Kennedy's grave, I just started sobbing uncontrollably. I was just like, I could really feel something there. And I was just, I just felt like here was a good person. He's not like he's the only good person, but here was a good person who was trying to do good. And then I turned around and I saw, and I just, I couldn't deal with it. Like it was really intense. And I turned around and I saw some of the quotes from some of his, his speeches. And then I continued crying. And I just thought what we feel here in the whole cemetery, like it's not just at that place, at the at that moment, that's what I felt most strongly. But what you feel there is love, love of country, right? And that's what's needed, right? More than precognition, more than skillful use of AI, like those things are important. But the love piece, I think we've sunk really into the fear piece and the anger mm -hmm. piece, and then back to the fear piece and the revenge piece. But the love piece is really 
part of things. I'm not saying, you know, this country hasn't done horrible things. This country has done horrible things like every other country, right? But there's love there that's real and palpable. And getting back to that is something that I'm, that's probably my biggest commitment. And I think disclosure helps with that because I think it's a reframe that would give people hope and stop looking at each other and start looking outward in terms of possibility. And one of the things I'm worried about is, I think we talked about this prior to the, the recorded interview, is this prospect of catastrophic disclosure, particularly if a peer competitor unveils it first. That happens. And I don't think Russia or China would do that. I just It's just not in their DNA. But if they were strategic, they would. Well, I don't know, because if they did, they know that we would just dismiss it. Right? I mean, I don't even know what if they what they would disclose would actually be true. It might be misinformation or disinformation. That's right? Fair. Yeah. So it's like, and that would be a fair question to ask. Yeah. <laughs> like, what are the motivations and what is this? So I feel like a better way forward is to to have a conference. I still want to do this thing where we have a conference where we sit in a state of love. So like stop the talking. Like I think talking just gets us in trouble. And I think start you can to have doing. It. Right. Yeah. Right. Just like 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 let's sit in a state of love with people with whom we fiercely disagree. Fiercely well, disagree. And, and, <clears throat> so to raise so to extend that and I think you have to we have to you know cut this short soon because I know you have a, a deadline. Right. But mm-hmm. I went to the Seoul symposium, you know, because I'm in Northern California, why not? And the one thing that my mind was racing about was somebody knows some core story, right? I don't know what that core story is, but there's a lot of things that are implied, actions that you need to, to take that are implied by that. And that's kind of the communications plan to different groups, the implications, second, third, fourth order on society. So what if telepathy is real? Well, that could be really disruptive for three years, right? (laughs) You know, where you you find your CEO is a sociopath, right? Like there are a lot of things like that that, again, but without knowing what this core story is, it's very difficult for outsiders to plan. Even what do you do with the technology? right? You know, Lockheed, I'm just going to say it, Lockheed Martin had these things for a while and they were advantaged versus illegally, I might add, versus other companies that may have since gone bankrupt. So you're going to have issues with that. How do you deal with that technology? Do you put it in a trusteeship and then have contractors bid on it? How do you ensure that that's secure? When whistleblowers come out, how do you prevent the Russians and the Chinese from targeting them? Like there's all sorts of things that people in government will have a lot of this perspective, but they're going to miss entire swaths of the things, not because they intend to miss them, but it's just because it's so bundled up and, and wrapped up. And I think, again, I don't know, without knowing what the core story is, I mean, the core story could be something like, there's life out there, they visited us routinely, we don't know who they are, we don't know where they're from, and we don't know what their intentions are, right? That's one extreme. It could also be we have treaties, mm-hmm. right, where we allowed abductions, and I have no, but I have no idea. Like, just we need some sort of a core story that we can orient on and then plan. And I agree with having the like something that a conference or a convention where we can focus on action and timelines. And the other thing I noticed too, well, is there's a lot of specialists love, in this field. First. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 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 There are a lot of specialists in the field who all sort of want to give their piece, but I think it's some, sorry, what did you want to finish off about saying about the specialists? Oh, the other thing too, I noticed I think where you were going is there's a ton of specialists, but there's not a lot of generalists. And the problem with specialists, and even I noticed at the at the event, you'd have somebody talking high tech talk, right? About talking about neutron and isotopes and isotopic ratios and this and that. And on the other hand, you have people talking about Max Weber and animism and Hegel and and like things are so ultra specialized that 
there's a greater need of people who are kind of generalists who can kind of bridge this stuff together and then get things done. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, it's kind of this talk. But just you need both, though. You can't do one without the other. Well, I think you could do without the need to be right. I mean, the problem with academia is there's this, like, it's all about being right. And that's mm -hmm. so boring. No one's yeah. going to no be right. And if you this were wrong 40 years no ago, right. you're going to defend that view to the death because that's your entire life in academia. That's your identity. Yeah. And the people who are challenging that also are not right. I mean, the, the situation is right. too complex for anyone to be correct, 100%. So acknowledging that is probably the biggest piece. And that actually relates to this idea that you mentioned about people in the government aren't going to get stuff. You know, before I started getting talking to people in intelligence community in the US and trying to understand, like, just as a scientist observer, like, what do you do? Like, what, what do you like? I thought those people, the government won't understand this stuff. But there are some, I mean, like, yeah, they do. <laughs> some of, yeah. 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 I mean, there are yeah. some really good, smart uh, uh, people who are aware of their political bias on either side of the spectrum and try to separate it out and or state it and say, this is my bias. And, but I see this, you know, which is actually opposes my bias. These are people who they actually create a recruitment system that tries to make sure that it's enough people on each side of the aisle who have those biases. I mean, this is a group of people who get it that a thinking mind is what is needed. And that thinking mind is created by a bunch of people who can think independently. So I think there's hope. I think there's a lot of hope there. And I think that they have been traumatized by being in a situation where their commander in chief did not trust them in any way or think that they were doing anything good. And so it feels to me like there's so much post-traumatic growth for the U.S. government. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I think this is one of those things you have to go through hell to get to heaven in a sense, right? You have to go through the chaos in order to get to the other side. And so I think this is something we're going through. All right. Mm -hmm. I, I'm like, exactly when you need this. <laughs> so... Right I appreciate you, D Thank Dr. You. Mosbridge. I, 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 Mosbridge. It's been fascinating and definitely would love to talk to you again in the future. Sean, I love it. And what a great capacity you have to talk about the highs and the lows and the general. It's fantastic. All right. Well, thank you very much. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, 
there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site. And there's also, you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.